All right. Hi, uh, my name is Heather Lawrence. I go by InfoSec Anon on Twitter. It's a cesspool. You might not want to go there. Uh, actually, I'm just more afraid they're going to look at my tweets and judge me. Um, I have been in information security since 2013. And uh, I would say that my uh, skill level in uh, navigating higher academia for this is why I'm really kind of giving this talk. I do data science at the Nebraska Applied Research Institute. Um, I was a six-year Navy veteran. I did, <laughs> I was a, a nuclear engineering technician before I joined InfoSec. So I've switched fields a couple of times. Uh, I went and did my bachelor's and master's uh, in computer engineering and uh, helped out with Hack UCF while I was there, did the National Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition, and I am now honored with uh, serving as a board member uh, for B-Sides Orlando, uh, VETSEC, uh, as a DEF CON goon, and Colonel CON. So I do a lot of volunteer work. I have done three PhD programs in like the last since 2017, so the last two years. I've been around a little bit, and I know that there are a lot of nuances that aren't generally uh, advertised when people are going to higher education for information security. Uh, here I have a, a PhD comic because uh, this person is talking about how the research is impossible. In the second slide, it's a paper with the same title that you are going to give your thesis and the last one is somebody already did it. And I have run into this multiple times where you're doing research and somebody has already done the research you think is impossible. It's not a, a secret that by 2021, we're going to need 470,000 cybersecurity professionals. Uh, according to the Aspen Cybersecurity Group, in this uh, paper they submitted called Principles for Growing and Sustaining the Nation's Cybersecurity Workforce. And basically, they broke it down and they said that demand's greater than supply. I think everybody knows that. Uh, the talent of some skilled candidates, those pools remain untapped, and they like to point out women, and they like to point out veterans, right? All of these skill pools that just we're not tapping yet. And this really important one is the complexity of employer requirements means that more than 50% of applicants are considered unqualified. And they even go further and say, to be blunt, we are over-specking cybersecurity roles to the point where so-called entry-level jobs require three to five years of experience. And if you get double-screwed, they really want you to have that education, that four-year formal education to show you, like show HR, you have that piece of paper and that you are educated. Here I have uh, when you want your junior SOC analyst to have five years experience before the age of 22, right? How many SOCs are, are you know, employing teenagers? Do you know any? Because I don't. Uh, ISACA came out with another report, and they said that keeping information security professionals is hard work. Ha! Huh. We all needed to know that, right? 70% uh, of the tech force is considered in play, meaning that they are going to change jobs within the next two years. 40% are considering changing jobs, right? Um, younger workers are less likely to tolerate burnout. I don't know if you're doing mentoring, but when I'm doing mentoring to younger people, I am telling them not to tolerate a toxic environment. If they are telling you you have to choose between family and work, or work is family, or some kind of paradigm along those lines, you need to run, and run fast. They also say in that report that employer paid training, that whole paradigm, is not effective enough to keep cybersecurity professionals. ISC Squared came out with another workforce study, right? This comes out a lot because there's so many people that we need, right? Uh, they asked professionals about what their career progression challenges looked like. And 28% said the cost of formal education to properly prepare for a career in cybersecurity was a top pro career progression challenge, right? And I don't know if anybody's gone to college lately, it, it's not cheap. And when you're doing college and work, you have no time. ISACA re recommends learning why employees leave, why they stay, uh, ample opportunities for advancement, skill training. The cybersecurity group that I mentioned before, they want you to have your hiring requirements 
based on foundational and professional skills and not on cybersecurity stacks, right? Don't ask that they can do Python. They probably haven't even seen Python. Ask if they've ever done programming, if they're capable of doing programming, if they have an analytical mind, right? Having those foundational skills are really important, but having the, the stack specific skills is not as important. And for those of you who don't like the, the groups, right, ISC squared or ISACA, maybe you have like political differences with their opinions. How about NIST? You guys like NIST? This is NIST 800-181, who basically straight, straight up telling you to train your people. Train them in-house. Don't send them somewhere else. Somewhere else may not be able to teach your, your people what you want them to know. And so does a formal education even help anyway? Here in this, the ISACA state of cybersecurity, 49%, their biggest skill gap is the, under, the uh, understanding the business. 34% is technical skills. And figure nine, this one is really important. All right, 38% neither agree nor disagree, 22% agree. 22% agree, right, that university graduates are well pre pre prepared for cybersecurity challenges. So you just went through a four-year degree and only 22% of professionals are thinking that you are capable of doing that job. That's a lot of debt for only 22% agree, right? So we had something called the National In Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, right? Just like uh, engineering degrees have certification bodies, there are information security groups that are trying to certify. Um, this is the NIST 800-181 I was referring to, and they define a total of uh, 52 work roles across 33 specialty areas. And they like to kind of describe things in what they call KSAs, which are knowledge, skills, and abilities. So the idea is that you take these securely provision, analyze, operate, and maintain, and you describe your hiring requirements as these KSAs instead of being stack specific. There is also uh, an NSA initiative called the National Centers of Academic Excellence. Uh, they have certified different programs in uh, academia, 270 institutions across 48 states. It's honestly the closest thing we have to cyber uh, accreditation. And what they do, what, uh, what program uh, managers do is they, they apply to have a team come out and certify their program. This is an ugly slide, I'm sorry, this is straight from, like, from them. The idea is that you have an associate's, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral. You have a core set of cybersecurity foundational knowledge units. Uh, you might have some technical knowledge units to on top of it, and maybe you have some like flavor, uh, flavor classes that they force you to take on top of those. So I'm not sure if you've been in information security academia, but formal academic institutions tend to teach theory over application. So it's really how something works. They don't teach tools, they don't really teach stacks, and they don't teach specific languages. But they can be influenced to teach for money. So if there is a, I don't, a professor that really likes Palo Alto and decides to go out and become part of their cybersecurity academic partner support, they can get Palo Alto uh, hardware and courses and information, right? But that, that bridge has to be formed first with that institution. Somebody has to go out and do that. That's not something that is inherently formed. And so if you, uh, your hiring manager, your organization is looking for people, don't go to an institution and expect that th your stack is being taught. It's not. And when I say that, um, the, right, they, they certify by mapping these knowledge units to uh, different program requirements. And if you can't see it uh, here, they're talking about software assurance. Some of the topics are separation of domains, isolation, encapsulation, principle of least privilege, right? These are all important topics, but how they are taught varies widely. The fact they are taught is all that they are being accredited on but how they are taught is not being evaluated. And that makes a huge difference when you evaluate the new people coming into your, your organization. So, something is written on the wall, but it doesn't seem fucking important. <laughs> it's like we are chasing our tails right now. 
if you want to go and to your organization and you want to train people, maybe create and locate knowledge repositories. A lot of this stuff is free now. Uh, I went through engineering school. Do you know how I taught myself? MIT open courseware because my teachers were terrible. InfoSec is not changed. In fact, I would argue that the info, uh, information security educators that are available right now are lackluster at best. Many have left the field 10 years ago and they don't know the, the, what the new technologies or techniques are. So this free training, right, go to Coursera, go to MIT OpenCourseWare, start an office library. This worked for us so well because now you have new people that don't have to spend the $60 on how to look at malware. They can teach themselves. That book is freely available to them. I know all of you purchase Humble Bundles like crazy and they sit there in your email and you don't actually look at them. What if you made that available to your office? Help people help themselves, right? Like, look at these courses. These, these things are free. Uh, control hijacking attacks, privilege separation, web security model. You literally go to a website and you can download PDFs on how to do these things, what MIT is teaching people for free. Other things that helped for us were polling the team to determine like, what they were comfortable in teaching and what people really wanted to learn. And please mentor your fucking people. Like, I don't know why I have to keep saying this, but like, if you are two years in and you aren't soft mentoring or hard mentoring a person, please unfuck yourself. Please. Here I have a tweet where it says, mentors are the real 10X engineers. They grow 10 more engineers. If you are a hiring manager, consider starting a mentor program, please. And if there is no one available to lead a small group, incentivize them to learn together, right? Sometimes the group environment, having that support and collaboration helps because looking at reverse engineering the first time, it's kind of, it's kind of daunting, right? Unless you've seen it before or you have somebody to be like, hey, I'd, I have no idea what this position in memory is. Does the stack grow down or grow up? People get afraid to ask those questions unless they have a mentor or somebody that they trust to not gatekeep them. Something else that helped for us, designing CTF challenges as a group or doing CTFs as a group and then solving them as a, as a group exercise. Wikis, blogs, how-tos, gotchas, lessons learned, lunch and learns. These were all things that we used to like, edify, to grow our new people. We had, in, we had an intern program. We went to our local uh, cybersecurity CTF group at a university and we were like, hey, do you want to intern with us? Can we help you out of your CTFs? Can we donate food? Establishing that, uh, that connection helps grow your talent pipeline. And you don't need information, or you don't need uh, academia to do it for you. You don't need to go to job fairs. You can literally go talk to these people one-on-one. -on -one. And you can hire software engineers and train them in information security, and they can still do the job. Thank you for letting me rant. You can direct inquiries to InfoSec and on. The slides you can get here if you wanted them. Uh, and I will answer any questions at this time. Yes, sir. You're going into the industry. Uh, four year or Okay, so the question is, what would I say to a new student who has just finished their four-year degree going into, <laughs> into the professional field? Uh, well, it kind of depends on how you spent your four years. If you did your four years and you did two internships at big tech and you have a resume and a LinkedIn, I'd say you're pretty good to go. Maybe you have a job. I hope you have a job before you leave. You should. Um, those internships, I'd say, were, would be key to getting your first job right out of the gate. Um, I would say continuing education is probably going to be the most key thing because you didn't learn a lot of the things that are important in information security now, likely in your four-year degree, unless you went to like an Ivy League, like top league. If you went to Ivy League, I, like you will go to CMU. 
I expect you to be able to operate in a SOC day one. Why? Because you went to CMU. If you went to like WGU and people are like, what is that? No, that's a university and they do offer an IA degree. Um, none of their stuff is really hands-on. I don't expect that you're gonna know any of the, like the technical skills or the stacks or the tools that are gonna, are gonna help you succeed. Did I answer your question? What do I think about cybersecurity boot camps? I think that uh, they used to have a problem with staffing nurses. And then there were a bunch of boot camps on how to become a nurse. And you know what? I don't think I really want somebody who's going to put a needle in my arm who went through a boot camp. Sorry. Um, boot camps are intended to be very fast paced. You get a lot of information, a lot of knowledge very quickly. And I'm sorry, but I don't retain information like that. I don't know if you do. Some people can. And more power to them. I can't. Yeah. Absolutely. How do you feel about that? Is it going to be a better way to that I think is a way better door. If you're using a boot camp to learn a specific skill and that skill is needed, uh, for example, Python, absolutely do that because it's going to be a quick way to get your feet wet and you will probably have projects or GitHub repos that you can show an employer like, hey, I did this thing. Here I'm showing you that I know how to do this thing. Uh, the comment from the audience was uh, they had done a boot camp and that is how they got into information security, is that correct? No. Uh, you just but did a boot camp. I, I did a boot camp because, uh, but like, there are people who do that. It's just, it will get you like, That's true. She, she brought up the, the point of career placement services for boot camps and that can be very beneficial instead of trying to do the recruitment shuffle or the recruit recruiter shuffle. Anything else? All right, thank you very much for letting me rant.